morning. Could you open your Bible to Psalm 33, 12 to 22. Psalm 33, 12 to 22. It is good to be back with you this morning. Had some great time off, but it's always good to come back home. Both ways. To go. I went to mom and dad's and spent a few days, and we did absolutely nothing. Uh, they had been going for about a month, uh, doing different things in the community, and they, mom had been at the church for, I think, eight hours a day for about three, four weeks, and she was tired, I was tired. We all just sat back and we did nothing. That was, that was fun. And uh, came back and made a mistake. I uh, was here a few days before I started work again, and told Tammy, I said, just leave me a list of things to do around the house, and I'll try to get them. I'll never do that again. <laughs> I learned a valuable lesson. But we are thankful uh, to be back and to see you uh, this morning. We had been in Alabama for about six months, I think it was, uh, working there at the university. And Kyle Butt was going to debate Blair Scott on the existence of God at the University of North Alabama. Well, it was going to be streamed live on the internet, but I wanted to go and be there in person and really wanted to take RJ to help fortify his faith. I thought it was going to be over Will's head, but, but I wanted to take RJ. And they were expecting this big overflow crowd. They had it. But I wanted to be there in person instead of having to sit there and watch it on the internet. Lo and behold, the college president came to me a couple days before the debate and handed me a couple VIP passes. That meant I had a seat. And not only that, I got to sit with RJ in the very front of the auditorium. So we went to the debate that night. Kyle Butt did an outstanding job. I was very impressed with him that evening. Blair Scott was very unprepared and really made himself to be a fool. And I kept thinking all through the debate, you know, the fool says in his heart there is no God. And, and he proved that very well that night. But about halfway through the debate, Dad texted me. He said, son, I like the yellow shirt. And I looked down. I'd forgotten what I'd worn. And lo and behold, I was wearing a yellow shirt. Unbeknownst to me, they had cameras aimed at the audience and they would show different people at different times. And was I ever thankful I wasn't doing something embarrassing when Dad found me and saw me there during the debate. Sometime after that, it was after Alabama had won the national championship that year, uh, Will, family and I were in Cracker Barrel and we were all in our Alabama gear that morning and we're eating breakfast and lo and behold someone comes up behind me and starts giving Will grief about his Alabama camp. I look around and it happens to be Bill Bajant who's coming to do our meeting in, in a couple months. Bill is a big Auburn fan. He is also, you understand, the dean at the university. He is my supervisor. Plus he is one of the elders where we go to church and he is also one of the Preachers there. So, I mean, you know, a triple whammy, so to speak. And here he is and out, and we didn't know he was there. They had been there the whole time we were. I looked at Will in all seriousness. I said, son, let this be a serious lesson. You never know who's watching you. You never know who sees what you're doing. I believe that was a very important lesson for him at that time. But you know how true that is in your own life. How many times have you gone to Walmart and a few days later someone comes up to you and says, I saw you in Walmart, but you never did see that other person? How many times have you been driving down the road and you've seen somebody and you've waved and waved and waved and that person never saw you coming or going or knew you were even there? You know that's very true in this world. It's also very, very true that God is closer than you think. That God sees everything that we do. That God sees us at all times. We read in Genesis 6, 5. How that God saw the wickedness that was upon the earth in the days of Noah. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. 
and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. You go over to the book of Hebrews. You read in Hebrews 4.13. There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and opened the eyes of him to whom we must give account. All things are naked, open, exposed to him to whom we must give account. In Psalm 33, the unknown psalmist takes up this theme again. And he tells us that God is closer than we think. And the point of the sermon this morning is simply this, taken from Psalm 33, that God sees what you do. God sees what you do. No one else on this earth may see what you do. No one on this earth may know what you do. Not your spouse. Not your parents. Not your children. Not the elders. Not your employer. Not anyone. But God sees what you do. Let's go, brethren, to Psalm 33 to learn this important lesson. Psalm 33, beginning with verse 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. I hear this verse quoted a lot around July the 4th or Election Day. Taken greatly out of context, I, I'm not saying it can't fit those circumstances, you understand. But in context, obviously, Israel is the nation God has chosen as his own. Israel is the only nation in the history of the world that God had chosen in that very special, narrow way. And the psalmist says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Why? Why would they be blessed? Well, he goes on to tell us. Israel was blessed because they had God as their Lord and because he saw what they did. Understand that. Remember that. Israel was blessed in the context of Psalm 33 because God has eyes. Because God saw. And in Psalm 33... God's vision is a double-edged sword. God's vision has a double nature. There's a negative way that God sees everything. Verses 13 to 17. God was able to see the sin and attacks of Israel's neighbors. Anything that Israel's neighbors did was against them. Any sins that Israel's neighbors committed, God was able to see. And God was able to punish. You find that in verses 13 to 17. There's also a very positive way, verses 18 to 22, where God was able to see the distress of Israel and come to their rescue. He would see what was going on and he would come and he would rescue them and help them. Uh, let us think first on that negative way in verses 13 to 17. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From the place of his dwelling, he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually. He considers all their works. Do you understand what the psalmist is saying? There is nothing you can hide from God. Nothing. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all all the sons of men. Obviously, that applies to Israel as well as her neighbors. God sees all the sons of men. No one is hidden from God. We hear occasionally of people getting away with murder. Unsolved crimes galore. Not unsolved in the book of God. God knows who committed those crimes. God knows who committed those sins. God will judge. God knows every single thing you have done. God will 
judge. You know, in my marriage, there are times that Tammy and I will be talking and something will jog the memory. And Tammy will say, Justin, did I ever tell you about this time when I was in college and we did such and such? Or sometimes the reverse is true. I say, Tammy, did I ever tell you about when I was growing up? And you do that too, right? There are things that you've forgotten about for years. Not told your spouse. You, you, you've even forgotten about it. But something jogs the memory and you share that memory together. I think that's a neat process of discovery in marriage as you get to know each other even better after all these years. Tammy and I still do that a good bit. But God already knew those things, didn't He? God had already seen those things take place. No secret to Him whatsoever. In fact, we read of the very same thing in Psalm 139, 110. There we read Psalm 139, 1 to 10. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my fault afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me behind and before you laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. I, it is high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. And your right hand shall hold me. You understand in Psalm 139, that's a positive thing, right? Wherever I go, God, you will be there. You will guide me. You will lead me. That's what David is saying. It's positive. You've hedged me in. You, you, you protect me because you see me. But don't lose sight of the fact that in Psalm 139, David says, God knows everything about us. God knows it all. And then we read, beginning at verse 15, or I'm sorry, 16. No king is saved by the multitude of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a vain hope for safety. Neither shall it deliver any by its great strength. You see the connection there? The enemies of Israel would come against them. They would attack. And the psalmist is saying, God sees it. God will stop it. If God determined a kingdom would not stand, it would not stand. Because God would see. Nebuchadnezzar learned that lesson. Remember his great boasting, his great arrogance. He walks upon the roof of his palace and he says, Is this not great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty. And then you remember a voice comes from heaven, Daniel 4.32 and says, Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to go out and you're going to live among the wild beasts until you know the Lord God reigns in the kingdom of men and gives to whom he will. You see, Nebuchadnezzar forgot the mighty God but the mighty God saw Nebuchadnezzar. He could forget God all he wanted to. But God knew it. God saw it. And God judged him for it. There is absolutely no way of hiding anything from God. But on the other hand, in verses 18 to 22, that concept is very positive. 18. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear Him, on those who hope in His mercy. Notice His eye is on them. To deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our hearts shall rejoice in Him because we have trusted in His holy name. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us just as we hope in you. 
Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon those who fear Him. To deliver from death, to deliver from famine. You obviously have to understand this promise in the context of the promises made to Moses over in Deuteronomy 28, 9-14, for example. That's just one place you find these promises. If the people of God did what God had commanded them to do, and they were faithful to His commandments, to His covenant, then God would bless them. They would have fruit in its season. They would have uh, children. They would have younglings of the flock. All those things God would take care of. God would bless them very richly, very materially with all that they needed if they were faithful to Him. And I think Psalm 33 picks up that theme and here's what it says. God will continue to bless you in that way if God sees that you're doing what is right. Notice what the psalm says. The eye of the Lord is upon those who do what is right. To protect from famine. To protect from death. And thus, in a very positive and good way, God would know what was taking place among His people. To help them. To rescue them when they were in distress. To be their guardian. To be their protector. Make no mistake, none whatsoever. God sees what you do. So what do we do? If God sees what we do, how should we then live? What does that mean when we get up uh, for work tomorrow morning? What's it mean as we sit down to lunch this afternoon? What's it mean as we go through day-to-day -day life? What does it mean that God sees what we do? When the principle in the psalm has two applications, a positive and a negative, I think we apply this psalm in those two ways. We have a negative application first, just as a psalm does, and then there's a positive application. Negatively, brethren, you must put away your sin. That's what the psalm is saying. You must put away your sin. The psalm teaches... God sees what we do and God judges what we do. If we want to escape that judgment of God, if we want to keep God from seeing evil and judging us for it, we have to get rid of it. We have to put it away. Throughout the scriptures, there is that principle. God sees the sin in our lives and God will judge us for it. Ecclesiastes 12:14. God will bring every work into judgment. Notice this part now. Including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Now pray tell me, brethren. How can God bring every secret thing into judgment unless God sees it? Unless God knows it? He can't, can He? He brings every secret thing into judgment because God sees. And again... Hebrews 4.13 There is no creature no creature hidden from his sight but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. There are the two ideas very firmly planted. One, God sees everything. No creature hidden from his sight. We're all naked. We're all laid bare before him. Why? Because to Him we must give account. You must put away the sin in your life. Here's what we do this week. What sin is it that God sees in your life this morning? As God looks at your life, what sin is it that He sees? If you notice your handouts this morning, there's a place for five sins. I want you to take some serious time and do some real serious self-examination. To look at your life as God sees it. And to list five sins. You don't have to do it right now. It doesn't have to be for somebody else to see. No, no, no. Between you and God. But I'll help you do it. To look at your life. What is it? That God sees when He looks there. What sin needs to be put far, far away from you? 
that you might stand righteous covered in the blood of Jesus. Okay, here's what you do. You take those five sins. I want you to focus on one of them this week. Not that that gives you a license to indulge in the other four. You understand that now. But one step at a time. Take one of those sins and that's going to be your focus this week. Here's what I want you to do with it. I want you to go to Scripture and find a host of Scriptures that speak to that sin. Commit them to memory. You've got to know these things. You've got to know these Scriptures. Remember what Psalm 119.11 says? Your word I've hid in my heart. Why? Just so I have it there? Just so it takes up space? No, 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 no. Your word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. But if we want to keep from sinning, we've got to know the word. Bring the word of God to bear on that sin. And then spend serious time in prayer about it. You remember Jesus when he goes to the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. You remember the Spirit leads him there to be tempted? But what does he do before he's tempted? He spends 40 days alone with God. And if the Son of God knew temptation was coming, if he spends 40 days alone with God, how can we not spend time alone with God but face Satan? If Jesus had to have the help of God, who do we think we are to do it ourselves? Pour your heart out to God for strength, courage, for help. And if you need help, seek help. That's why we're here. Galatians 6.1 Brethren, if the man is overtaken in trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, watching yourselves lest you also be tempted. If you need help, the elders and I are here, brethren. We'll help. We'll pray. We'll cry. We'll do whatever we can to help. Because we have to put away sin from our lives. We've got to. Because God sees what we do. There also, of course, in the psalm, at the end of the psalm, is a positive application of this principle. The application we want to learn this morning is this. That God will bless you in adversity. God will bless you in adversity. Now, in the psalm, He blesses differently than He does now. You and I both understand that. In the psalm, it is, if you're faithful to the law of Moses, He will not let famine come. He will not let you see death, and that means hell, I believe, in context. He won't let these things come upon you. You understand, famine comes, whether we're doing the will of God or not. <coughs> Suffering comes, whether we're doing the will of God or not. What God does now is God walks with us through adversity. God blesses us in adversity in a very special way. Here's what the brother of Jesus writes in James 1, 2-4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Count it joy when you suffer? That's what James says. Why? How? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If we want to be spiritual giants, we're going to have to suffer. If we want our faith to grow and prog grow, we're going to have to have adversity. We're going to have to struggle in that adversity with God, with the help of God, that He can mold us and shape us into what you and I need to be. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you face adversity, 
because it's in that adversity that God comes to us and God shapes us. It's through that adversity. Put away your sin. Let God shape us in adversity. Those are sure promises of God. Brother, think about this way. If we as the body of Christ were really to come to understand that God sees what you do, how do you think our lives would be different? If that were a firm principle that guided our lives, how would we live? Tell you what, I think we get serious about sin, don't you? I think we'd want God to see good in our lives, not the evil. We'd want to see God, we'd want God to see us loving. We'd want God to see us forgiving. We'd want God to see us praying. We want God to see us being faithful in every facet of life. Because we understand God sees this. And we'd want to please Him with everything that He saw in our lives. And I believe that when we faced hardship, we wouldn't look to others to help for help. We, we would look inward when depression and all that. But we look upward. We look to the God who saw what we were enduring. Who promises to walk with us every step of the way. And we'd rely on His strength and His power to get us through. You know, I've talked with many people who have faced serious struggles, far, far more and different than I've ever faced in my life. You know what those people tell me invariably? If it weren't for God, that's what Psalm 33 teaches us. If not for God, God sees and God will help. What is it that you want God to see this morning? What, as God looks at your life, what is it, number one, does he see? Number two, what is it you want him to see? Is it that he needs to see you being obedient to his will? Do you need to come this morning and allow God to see your faithfulness shine through? Do you need to come and be baptized in Jesus? Having turned from sin, putting it away from you, Confessing that sweet and precious name. Being raised to walk in newness of life. Do you need to come and ask our prayers this morning for strength, to help you put away sin, to repent of sin as a child of God, and let us pray with you and for you. If you need to come this morning, won't you come right now as we stand and sing?